Hello there! You're listening to The Asian Scholar, the official podcast of the Teaching and Researching International Law in Asia, or TRILA program, at the Center for International Law, National University of Singapore. Here, we will share with you our stories as Asian international law academics, researchers, students, and practitioners our innovations in addressing the challenges that we face in teaching and doing research on international law, how we promote the Asian voice in the academic community, and international lawmaking, and most importantly, how we reacquaint ourselves with our own legal history and culture. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Asian Scholar the official uh, podcast of the Trilla program here at the Center for International Law, National University of Singapore. So for this episode, we have another interesting uh, topic, and we're going to bring you to another part of Asia, and that is in South Asia. Uh, We're going to talk about teaching international law in Nepal. With us today, is Amrita Shenoy, who is currently based in in Nepal. Amrita is an assistant professor from um, Kathmandu School of Law, which is affiliated to Porbanchal University in Nepal. I will let her uh, tell you more about herself. Amrita? Yeah, thank you, Amil. Uh, I teach uh, international environmental law to LLM students. Uh, and sometimes uh, public international law to LLB students. I have also taken classes on international relations uh, before. Uh, and I also tried to connect, you know, uh, the curriculum of international relations to international law to make it more interesting and also to, uh, you know, uh, give importance to the idea of studying international relations to LLB students. Apart from that, uh, about me, I've pursued my MPhil PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University in India, uh, New Delhi. And I completed my LLB from uh, Government Law College, Ernakulam, Kerala from India. So I am an Indian citizen uh, who is in Nepal. Uh, For a very personal reason, though, that I married a Nepali uh, citizen. Uh, But uh, since 2018, I've been uh, teaching in Nepal uh, out of my own choice. And I really enjoy uh, being here because of the, you know, importance uh, which uh, teachers really get here uh, compared to uh, India. And also a lot of, uh, you know, independence to teach and use different methodologies even though we have a fixed curriculum uh, given by the university, but within that, uh, I, I try to experiment uh, with my own viewpoints and uh, things, especially, you know, uh, talking about twail. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes, well, thank you, Amrita. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, that you um, obtain your legal education from India and now you're uh, building an academic career in, in Nepal. So I'm just curious, did you have to make a huge adjustment when it comes to well, what you know in terms of legal background from India and uh, now in Nepal? Uh, see, uh, with regard to legal background, uh... One aspect is the case law, which is uh, uh, recorded here, is in Nepali. Now I'm learning Nepali because uh, the official Nepali is different from our regular views. So uh, I can interact uh, better than before, but uh, reading the case law and all, I've been uh, doing it recently. And uh, one thing that I've learned being in Nepal is that Teaching is not a one-way process. Like I've mentioned it in my blogs also and in various other uh, write-ups that uh, teaching is about learning from the students yeah. uh, mm-hmm. and also talking what you know to them. And even in my classes, I tell them that, that it is your duty also to correct the teacher and also know the limitations of the teacher uh, because I'm from India and I don't know many aspects of Nepal. I'm still learning them. Mm -hmm. So there are various aspects which I learned from the students. For example, the history of Nepal, 
Mm -hmm. uh, I was reading a book on Nepal and its history and then uh, students gave me more insights on a text called the Vyopadesh. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a Nepali text on international relations and how a king should rule. Mm -hmm. And in that, there were aspects of international relations that Nepal should maintain a balance between India and China. Mm -hmm. Like those aspects, uh, students have, uh, you know, given... Uh, that insight to me mm -hmm. and in in uh, various other you know case law or or aspects uh, which I didn't know they have enlightened me so uh, teaching in Nepal is a good experience in that the students have you know accepted me despite those flaws and also uh, allowed to uh, learn mm -hmm. and they have helped in uh -huh. learning a lot yeah i totally agree with you you know um i um, when i taught public international law before um it was a two-way learning process really um nowadays students know many things it's really different compared to you know many years ago maybe during the times of our parents or grandparents where uh, the teaching methodology was more of a one-way system, one-way style, more like a lecture-based system. But now we can also learn a lot from our students. Speaking about public international law subject, uh, my question is, is it a compulsory subject in, uh, in the legal education curriculum in Nepal? Yeah, uh, it is. In most of the uh, colleges, it is a compulsory uh, subject. Uh, at which level is it being taught? In uh, Kathmandu School of Law, the second year we have international relations and third year uh, we have uh, international law, public international law. Mm. Uh, so, and also human rights. Could you say that um, the level of interest of the students in terms of studying international law is already high or... Basically, are they interested at all in studying public international law? Uh, I think that also depends on students to students. Those who are uh, interested in uh, mooting, they definitely uh, try to learn more of uh, international law. There are other students who uh, learn it for the sake of it, but then uh, some of them are truly interested. They interact even though they are not mooters. Uh, they interact and they give us ideas uh, regarding uh, international law and how it can be connected to Nepal or, you know, recently there were a few issues, for example, the territorial issue with India, uh, which uh, made them think about international law and uh, like uh, various other things, uh, maybe say how intellectual property rights is uh, you know, being incorporated from WTO to, uh, the, from trips to uh, mm -hmm. Nepal standards. So those aspects are making them interested in it, mm -hmm. uh, I think, generally. So mm -hmm. the first thing that I do in my classes is, uh, I've learned it from uh, Professor B.S. Chimney, who uh, is my supervisor and also taught us in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He... Uh, the first class which he taught was the importance of international law. Mm -hmm. So I've blended it uh, in a different way, like uh, showing the booklet of uh, the American Society of International Law, how uh, international law uh, affects us in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I show them the counter argument, like uh, 50 ways international law harms us by Jose Alvarez. <laughs> so these two documents, I uh, give it to them for reading or sometimes make them read in the class and thereafter we discuss. And uh, the first booklet uh, series uh, which we plan, which we have already written, that is how international law affects daily lives of Nepalese. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether it be standardization of time, standardization of weights, trade, because Nepal is an import-oriented uh, state. Mm. Migrant workers, a very big issue for Nepal. Mm. Um, 
and Nepal is not a party to the convention yet. And uh, most of the Nepali workers who travel abroad are in the Gulf countries. Uh, they're also, uh, we don't find much protection to the Nepali migrant workers. So a lot many issues uh, affects the daily lives of uh, Nepali people. So when we talk about the importance of international law in our daily activities and daily lives, I think uh, that itself creates uh, interest in learning more about international law. Yes, I totally agree with you. And this is a very important uh, jump off point, especially for, for academics, for teachers who are teaching uh, public international law. Uh, the first thing that we have to do is really to uh, build the foundation and make the students uh, get interested in learning the topic itself. And um, the reason why I brought this uh, up, and uh, I'm very glad that you know you extensively explain why international law should be studied in Nepal, because um, this is an issue that... Um, was brought up by many Asian academics, even uh, before, you know, rem uh, remember when uh, we uh, conducted or we organized a conference here in Singapore back in 2018. And in the workshops that we organized after that, it's a recurring issue really on how to get the students uh, involved or be interested in studying the topic. And one of the suggestions is, of course, one of the broad suggestions is um, to make them appreciate that international law matter in our daily lives. And so it's important for teachers to, to be able to relate to, you know, concrete uh, issues, global events that affect the daily lives of our own students. Um, I would like to talk about your teaching methodology and style, Amrita, if you don't mind. Do you have any particular style when it comes to or activities that you that you hold in class to make the students be more interested or more involved? Like, for example, maybe, you know, watching movies or, you know, um, songs or music and other activities in class other than mooting, of course. Yeah, uh, for example, I've been showing animations, uh, like there's a channel called Lex Animata, which has like small animations on different uh, aspects. So when we were discussing about shrimp turtle case of uh, WTO, panel and appellate body, we, we showed that uh, video to them. Um, and... Similarly, like various, there are uh, about basic videos or animations of uh, different these things. So few of the movies that I discussed recently uh, and related it to international law and human rights is uh, Moana. Moana? Uh, Moana. Who would have thought that Moana is related to international law? Uh, why did you say so? Actually, uh, I, I saw the song, Where You Are. And then I realized that uh, maybe this can be connected to, you know, UNDRIP. Uh -huh. uh, then I started reading more about Moana. Uh, then I came to know that this is the first time that uh, a black uh, woman has been shown by Disney. Mm -hmm. and being the main character of a movie. A woman, a black woman and mm -hmm. an indigenous woman being the main character. So we can bring in the idea of intersectionality there, right? Where uh, various layers of uh, a woman's life can be uh, showcased. A woman uh, of color, yes. Mm -hmm. Woman of color who has been um, shown. So <clears throat> because of these, like we can connect it to UNDRIP, which uh, allows them the idea of self-determination and these things. And similarly, I connected this story to Chinua Achebe's novel, uh, that is, Things Fall Apart. Uh, so half of the novel is about the governance system, the lifestyle, the food they eat and everything. But after reading uh, that, we realized why that discussion was important. Mm -hmm. Because when the colonizers come and they establish their own governance system, the changes which are brought in the tribe, uh, cannot be seen by the protagonist who yeah. was in exile for seven years. 
and when he comes back he sees the change and he's disturbed by the change and not being the spoiler but at the end of it he commits the suicide and uh, why that novel is like important looking at it from this viewpoint mm -hmm. so i discuss moana and the novel uh, for uh, indigenous rights and um, those aspects why we should why our lifestyle would be different from mm -hmm. you know the indigenous lifestyle very interesting then, novel i would love to i personally have not read that novel so i would love to read it um and I like your what you said about uh, Moana in relation to self-determination. Because Moana is all about self-identity, discovering your self-identity, which is very important for most Asian countries. Because most Asian countries are colonized. We're colonized. It's part of our history, really. And I think teaching international law, uh, beginning from that point, you know, discovering your self-identity and the idea of self-determination is very important. Yes, uh, wonderful movie. Um, what else? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think one another movie I would like to uh, mention uh, is Jai Beam, uh, which was an official entry from uh, uh, India to the Oscars, but a very uh, wonderful movie uh, made with so many nuances of, uh, you know, the struggle of a tribal woman to gain justice. So Jai Bhim means uh, victory to Bhim. Bhim is uh, uh, B.R. Ambedkar, uh, who is the father of uh, Indian constitution. And uh, he fought for a casteless society. Mm -hmm. But even today we can find so many struggles and so many uh, issues coming up in news with regard to uh, you know caste that uh, with uh, the diaspora of hindus mm -hmm. uh, caste system would travel worldwide so uh, therefore uh, B.R. Ambedkar is a very important uh, personality to discuss about even though there is an idea that uh, caste is not race and race is not caste Nevertheless, caste is uh, a very different system, mm -hmm. but it needs, uh, you know, some sort of a control from international legal perspective also. Seems to be a very wonderful and interesting uh, movie, Amrita. What about, um, you know, series or uh, shows online that uh, you also recommend to your students? Yeah. Uh, apart from these, like I've talked about a uh, few movies like the Tokyo Trial, mm -hmm. uh, which talks about the international criminal law. It's a web series uh, in Netflix. Uh, then my friend, Dr. Suve Mon from University of Malaysia, uh, who is an expert in maritime security, talked about uh, Captain Phillips. Uh, so I discussed that also when we were talking about UNCLOS and the crime, international crime of piracy and how difficult it is to maintain maritime security. Uh, then when we discuss about Holocaust, we can talk about The Pianist. Mm -hmm. And another movie is uh, Justice at Nuremberg. While discussing diplomatic immunity, uh, there's Argo, mm -hmm. which talks about the Iran uh, hostages case. Then uh, one Hindi movie, uh, which talks about women and the idea of consent. It's also a trial movie of uh, Amitabh Bachchan. Uh, it's pink. Pink. So, yeah. So when we talk about maybe a feminist perspective to international law or uh, women and rights or gender perspective, we can talk about pink. With regard to international environmental law, uh, a movie which uh, was released long time back, and I think Julia Roberts uh, won an Oscar for that, is Erin Brokovich. Mm -hmm. So it's a struggle of a woman uh, against a company uh, which contaminates the water and causes not many health issues, and it's a, a real uh, life story. Uh, how environment is harmed by the company. So now when we have the idea of 
United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, we can link these uh, movies to uh, that, yeah. like how the companies should also take care of the environment. Mm -hmm. Apart from these, like we show different videos, like DW documentaries are very interesting for uh, environmental law. Uh, one student said, okay, uh, I would like to write a term paper on music and international relations. So I said, okay, that's fine. Like, uh, how will you link it? So he gave an example of uh, a Nepali singer called Deepak Bajracharya mm -hmm. and uh, about his song called Man Magan. Mm -hmm. So he said that uh, when we have, uh, when Deepak Bajracharya went to the US, he was using guitar and uh, singing Nepali songs. So some people uh, criticized him like, why are you using guitar and, you know, singing Nepali songs? Why don't you sing with Nepali instruments? So therefore, to show the world mm -hmm. the diversity of Nepal and the culture of Nepal, mm -hmm. he came up with this song called Man Magan. So that's how it is. Then uh, with regard to recently, there's a very famous song of Makeba Makeba. So I came to know that the song is against apartheid, uh -huh. uh, a tribute to uh, Miriam Makeba, who is, uh, uh, say, a person who fought against apartheid, had to leave South Africa because of her ideology and thought process. But going beyond that, she, you know, uh, through her songs, she gave her message. So how music can be important? Maybe through music, songs, and pop music, or anything, we can connect it to international law, international relations, and that can make things interesting. But it's but I would like to say that uh, always it's not helpful. We also need to discuss yeah. Come back to treaties, textbooks, articles. Yeah. Those things. These are really good ideas, you know, Amrita. Um, you know, show showing movies, um, suggesting novels, uh, literature, music. They may be unconventional, but they are important materials in terms of teaching because I think that they relay a different kind of message a message that the students get to students nowadays they get to appreciate more i have my own you know list of movies and series that i watch i like the avatar the movie avatars it was a box office hit and um you know when i was watching it with some of my friends here i uh, told them we are in agreement that it's like this is very related to again uh, indigenous people's rights so the context is uh, the future of humanity. It's beyond Earth already, but it's all about colonization once again and, you know, the struggle between the colonizers and the indigenous people somewhere else. So it's a recurring issue, whether, you know, in the past or in the future. Talking about, um, you know, issues that are relevant to Nepal, how do you, how do you localize international issues, Amrita? Um, how do you integrate um, local materials in your own uh, class? What I do is uh, while preparing the reading list or something, uh, I try to connect it to materials which are there of uh, Nepali authors. For example, uh, internalization of international law to domestic law. We have an article by Professor Geeta Pathak, mm -hmm. uh, published in uh, Kathmandu School of Law Review. Mm -hmm. So that article gives a lot, many examples of uh, Nepal and also case law, mm -hmm. a comprehensive case list. Um, and maybe like uh, she will update it because it was published in 2018. Mm -hmm. And uh, she will update it because a lot many developments have taken place after that. Mm -hmm. uh, when we discuss about treaty law, we have uh, Surya P. Subedi's uh, old article, though, on treaty law. Then uh, Professor Surya P. Subedi and Pratishu Preti have written an article about Nepal in the Oxford Handbook mm -hmm. of uh, 
um, Asia and international. I think that's the one. So uh, that article also talks about uh, Nepal and international law to Nepal. Mm -hmm. um, so when we see that, uh, you know, how uh, people like, and also uh, Professor Yubraj Sangrola is the executive director of uh, Kathmandu School of Law. He used to teach public international law here. So now he has like uh, gone into jurisprudence and other things. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are a few articles uh, written by him on that. One very important issue which he has raised is about the Gorkhas. So there's a booklet on Gorkhas, how the Gorkhas were, uh, you know, traded for mm -hmm. by the Rana prime ministers to the British mm -hmm. uh, after the Treaty of Sugon. Yeah. So when there was war between Nepali and um, British uh, during the i think in 1816 this treaty of sugali was uh, so it was an unequal treaty clearly it was an unequal treaty so most of the treaties if we see that uh, at that time with asian uh, states were unequal in nature that's what even ch electra alexandrovic says right it's a very interesting point, you know, when you talk about uh, the Treaty of Sugauli, and you did mention it is a clear example of an equal treaty. It reminds me of uh, the Treaty of Nanjing, um, the 1842 Treaty of Nanjing between uh, it, uh, China and um, the British Empire at that time, you know. Again, another example of an equal, uh, an equal treaty. Uh, and I think it's important to uh, to talk about this topic and to mention these materials in in public international law classes in Asia, because most of the traditional textbooks that are published by you know um, uh, our colleagues from from the West, they don't really deal much about um, these specific issues that are unique to Asia. And I think these are some of the issues that, uh, once again, you know, students can easily relate to because it's related to their own history, uh, their own history there in, in Nepal, for example. All right, Amrita, now going towards the last part of our conversation, which um, you did mention that you are affiliated uh, with the International Law and Relations Study Center there in the law school. In the center, you also collaborate with different institutions, uh, not just in Nepal, but also in different countries. Is it important nowadays to build collaborations with other academic institutions uh, outside our own countries? And what is the value of that collaboration to your own institution? Yeah, collaborations are important because it helps in sharing expertise, the first thing. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, also, we have like a teacher training course, which is coming where we'll be discussing different topics and that would help us in updating. Mm -hmm. And because, uh, you know, I participated in Trilla, I could get so many ideas from different teachers. Uh, we got the reading lists mm -hmm. of uh, different teachers. Participation in Trilla gave me a very different uh, viewpoint. Now, talking about International Law and Relations Study Center, basically, it conducts international programs. Like yearly, it conducts um, a diploma course, uh, a winter school, basically, on uh, economic, social, uh, and development rights. So there are various topics uh, discussed yearly. So uh, one of my upcoming articles in the Journal of International Law and Comedy is on Twail and Himalayas. Like mm -hmm. Twail discusses international environmental law uh, rarely. But who will talk about an issue like Himalayas? Himalayas is very important because if the glaciers melt at a very fast pace, mm -hmm. then it would lead to subversions of Mm -hmm. you know a lot of land of South Asia itself it's a regional issue mm -hmm. and environment itself is a global issue yes mm -hmm. so this issue was highlighted in the um, ESDR program 
so we are going to revive it. Uh, what happened because of pandemic, we could not do it. And uh, we are also about to come up with, uh, you know, some of the missed issues of Kathmandu School of Law Review and also the latest issue of 2023. Uh, so we are working on that. Great. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, reading your upcoming publication on Twail and Himalayas. You're right. These are some of the things that, well, first of all, the issue is, is an existential issue. I totally agree with you. And most of the time uh, when people talk about climate change, vis a -vis existential issue, the first thing that people would uh, think about are, you know, the people living in a small island states. They are also in a very crucial situation. Yeah. But um, of course, um, the situation of Nepal and you know those uh, within the vicinity of the Himalayas is a different context that we need to also talk about and discuss. Are there any projects that you are working on? Uh, see, uh, we began with a project of um, writing an edited volume, bringing mm -hmm. out an edited volume with uh, Springer. Uh, so I'm working with uh, Tamil Ananta Vinayagan. Um, He's uh, an Ireland-based uh, professor of international law mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps human rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and I planned uh, an edited volume on human rights from the global South perspective. Mm -hmm. So it will be published this year. The name of the book is Wretched of the Global South. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a human rights perspective from uh, the global South. Mm -hmm. uh, like alternative perspectives on human rights. It's interesting because uh, scholars from South America, Africa, Asia, all have brought uh, different perspectives, which we don't find in regular human rights mm -hmm. books. It's one of the positive things that uh, came out of the pandemic. And, um, and, uh, again, this is related to what we were discussing earlier about the importance of collaboration. And I also think that we have so much to learn really from our colleagues from Latin America, from Africa, and even from within Asia. You're right. I remember back in 2018 when we did a survey about whether there's a question in that survey, whether there's um, an Asian perspective to international law. And most of the respondents said, yes, there is, but it's multiple perspective, which means that we have so many different perspectives within the Asian society itself, and we can learn so much from, from each other, basically. So thank you so much, uh, Amrita. I'm very excited to, to read and to learn more about your upcoming um, research projects, and I'm uh, I appreciate that you shared your, your experience, your wisdom, your time with us. I learned so much about your teaching style and the teaching culture or academic culture in, in Nepal, which, again, like I said, um, not many people know about. And it's important that, you know, our other colleagues in academic community should learn something about Nepal as well and India. And I will definitely check out the movies and novels and series that you mentioned. I think um, it's something that I and our other colleagues can talk about in our own classes as well. Thank you. Thank you, Emil, for calling me. Thank you for listening and joining our conversation. We'll see you again in another exciting episode of The Asian Scholar. For now, enjoy the rest of the day.